Are you looking for a new job? Are you hiring but can't find diverse, talented candidates? Then we have something that can help, our job board. Just head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to browse listings or to place your own. This week on the job board, Work & Co. is looking for a number of different positions, a lead developer, a senior QA analyst, a designer, and a lead designer. Now, all these positions are located in Brooklyn, New York, with the lead developer and senior QA analyst positions having hybrid work schedules. Bravely is looking for a sales development manager in New York City. Duo Security, now a part of Cisco, is looking for a senior design engineer. Vote.org is looking for a product analyst. This is a remote position. And GBH is looking for a motion designer slash editor in Boston, Massachusetts. For just $99, we will feature your listing on our job board for 30 days and help spread the word about it to our audience of listeners. We also offer an annual job board subscription for companies and organizations. Make sure to head over to revisionpath.com forward slash job for more information on these listings and others. Apply today and tell them you heard about the job through Revision Path. Get started with us and expand your job search today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. And before we get into this week's interview, let's take some time out and thank our accessibility sponsor for this episode, Brevity and Wit. Brevity and Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit, creative excellence without the grind. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking with strategist, educator, and art curator Andre Smith, co-founder of strategy and branding firm Appendix. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. Hey, uh, my name is Andre Smith. People call me Dre. I am a strategist, an educator, and a recovering curator. Recovering curator? A lot of my work has to do with, the, I guess you could say, the confluence of the fine arts, academia, and advertising. And uh, I've been in and out of curatorial since about 2015, uh, but I had a bit of a pivot in about 2018 when I, my gallery became the classroom and my canvas became a syllabus. Okay. We'll get into that a little bit later. I was just curious that you <laughs> threw it out there like that. How has 2021 been going for you so far? Better than 2020. 2020 was dope, though. It was like a victory lap for me. Uh, if you listen to Nipsey, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I went from the classroom to brand side for an e-learning platform and then agency side for agency of the year, 2020, and what was considerably the hardest year for any business, particularly marketing, media, and comms. So that was pretty cool. And uh, 2021's been been better still. Has it been hard kind of adjusting to working from home? Not per se. When I was teaching at UIC, that's when the pandemic had hit. And uh, I began working from home doing hour and hour and 15 uh, minute long sessions with 40, 50 students. So I got used to seeing a green dot pretty effectively. And then working for Masterclass, which was based in San Francisco at the time when I was based in Chicago, had to perform servicing those hours. And then when I was with Martin, I was in San Francisco servicing hours on the East Coast. You know, like I said, better still. <laughs> Man, you were burning the candle at both ends, it sounds like. Yeah, uh, I have a seven month old, uh, Chloe. So th- that plays a role too. And mm-hmm. week by, day by day, week by week, month by month. She's crawling and trying to stand on her own now. 
working from home has, you know, you're adjusting on multiple clocks, hybrid work model, the work from home model, as well as the growing baby model. Yeah. Talk to me about your agency appendix. Like what's an average day like for you? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I started, uh, I opened up appendix, think of it like a boat shop for like go fast boats, right? For planning services and future proof strategies. I started appendix, I want to say February. So like basically right after Martin and a day at appendix is waking up around 7 a.m. watching some Bloomberg, watching some CNBC, spending about an hour on my phone, and then seeing what the algorithm feeds me, you know, depending on what platform I start with first, it'll start the rabbit hole of what I'm researching. And then my research might lead to me thinking about someone in my network, and that might lead to a text, and then that reply will lead to, dude, I was just thinking about you. Or what I say to them, and they're like, that's crazy. I just had a conversation about that in my Slack, right? So that'll lead to leads, right? And uh, getting those leads warm, especially through the network, on a Monday might lead to a conversation about a brief by a Wednesday, and that might lead to paperwork, et cetera, by a Friday. So the day, the, the Tuesday and Thursday are spent uh, holding it down at home, uh, tracking those things and getting other things in the queue. Now, your work involves like brand strategy. It involves culture research. And it also sounds like it involves some creative development as well. Like when you have a new project that comes in, like what does that process look like? How do you approach it? So my practice area is really when you like pure brand wise is really a lot to do with brand purpose, uh, brand casting, which is really a lot around inclusion and diversity, branded entertainment and social impact. And as far as brand strategy in particular, it's really a lot to do with organic social, paid social, social commerce, and experiential. Where that sits to answer your question is it's a lot more to do with what is the opportunity or the brief asking of my skill set? How do I design or strategize a vector of what's relevant and what's relative for that opportunity? What are like the best types of clients for you to work with? Because I mean, it sounds like your work really can like span a number of different fields. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Um, just most recently, I did some brand identity work for Gallery 88. That's, uh, that's spearheaded by Alex Dulwich Davis. Um, she's an inaugural member of that Hennessy Never Stop, Never Settle cohort. I do a lot of brand identity work for Key Henderson. She used to manage 21 Savage. Now she manages ASEAN, who's the voice of Karma on Karma's World on Netflix. And I've also most recently consulted for CSOs and CMOs uh, at different agencies. So um, working on Cricket Wireless and Quilted Northern for AT&T and Georgia Pacific, respectively, for the CSO of their AOR, likewise at Martin in that way for Haynes, UPS, and Unilever's acts. Now, before you were at Appendix, you you know, just now mentioned the Martin Agency, you mentioned Masterclass a little bit earlier. What did you kind of gain from those experiences that you still use today? The CEO at Martin, uh, Kirsten Cavello, she has a phrase, um, it takes tension to get attention. Of all the, you know, amazing gems I picked up working across, you know, $3.5 million worth of marquee accounts. That's the phrase that always sticks out. Um, that's the phrase I think I draw from for my like my best memory from working at Martin. Learning that and learning that in numerous contexts. Uh, context, uh, whether that was on the accounts that I was uh, staffed on as the planning director for the social studio, or if it was more project things like Amerisave or Happy Egg or Old Navy. Prior to that, most recent experience masterclass phrase or takeaway or big thing from that. I think I heard on, on a Zoom, someone said, uh, there are different dials to diversity. And knowing at least that that's uh, part of the, the energy or attitude or thinking at a tech company, essentially, was great for me. I think I reflected a lot of what I was most happy about with masterclass and that ad week feature I did back in February. And uh, prior to Masterclass, where I was consulting for their CMO, I was in the classroom at UIC. And I think a big favorite quote of mine 
or uh, your experience that, that can be put into a quote or alchemized into a quote is um, Google and then go outside. My friend Andy Diaza uh, said that when he came to guest lecture for me, amongst a, a host of other awesome guest lecturers like um, Joe Freshgoods, Ferris Bueller, Sam Kirk, Mindori McSwain, who's now the AD of uh, Brand Strategy at Spotify. But that was, like, I think my most favorite quote, because that was something that the students would say back to me over the semester and the students who would then take me for other classes. Um, when I was at UIC, I taught consumer behavior, global marketing and advertising and sales. But, but the students who started with me in taking me for consumer behavior, who took me for global marketing and ad sales, that's a phrase that they would impart back to me. So it was nice to see the, uh, the ripples in the pond. I guess. Yeah, it's interesting. Like sometimes from those past experiences, you have to sort of be out of them to really learn or know what you've learned from them. Because when you're in it, it's a bit of a different story. Couldn't agree more. So let's, you know, let's switch gears here a little bit. You know, we've learned a bit about kind of the work you're doing now, but let's let's hear more about your origin story. Like, tell me uh, where you grew up. I think of myself as a global citizen, but at the end of the day, I'm still just a kid from the North Bronx. I grew up just shy of Gun Hill Road on Burke Avenue in a, I guess what used to be very Italian and Jewish, but by the time, you know, 86 is my year. So by the time I, I, I was on the scene, right, came to life, it was predominantly Caribbean. And to this day, it still is very much Jamaican, Trinidadian, Guyanese families that historically have occupied these homes, uh, generationally have occupied these homes. And my Origins, I guess, you know, besides being a kid who grew up from in the Bronx and, you know, still frequently go back, even just to you know, sit in the car in front of like the house I grew up in, you know, just to keep that connection, I guess. My origin side growing up from the Bronx is uh, what well, a lot of people don't know maybe about me because they see me in art galleries or they see me in advertising or they see me in the classroom is I started in music. My mom's younger brother is a successful music director and bassist. He went to actually he went to SUNY Purchase with Amanda Seals, uh, Amanda Diva, Tiffany from uh, Insecure. Mm -hmm. And short story about him, he had the opportunity to tour with Lauren Hill and the Fuji's Global. I think it was going to be like his first date was going to be in Japan, but it was between going on tour with the Fuji's and uh, going to college. And my mom was like, if you get your teaching license and and uh, you get your degree, you know, you can tour with anyone and you can also have the backup plan of, um, of having other options. He was torn about it, but decided to, you know, go to school and pass on the opportunity. At the same time, my dad's older brother had a recording studio in his basement and he would have like, you know, local acts who would you'd end up hearing on um, the halftime show on uh, NYU or Seton Hall's, um, Seton Hall radio. He would have like, like T weapons or artists like that. And I guess between seeing my un my younger un my mom's younger brother's conflicts between the bright lights and the steady road, and my dad's older brother's approach of having a steady road but also having an entrepreneurial spirit, because he split the basement with my aunt who had a hair salon. So the basement of that house was basically like all business, right? It was like a <laughs> cash and carry operation, and um, that that had a very big impression on me. Uh, I think understanding how to keep a main line, but also keep your eyes open for other bigger opportunities. And then talking about looking for bigger opportunities, I ferocious, I was always a ferocious reader, even if I didn't like class. And uh, I, I loved reading Double XL and The Source and uh, Bonsu Thompson, Jason Rodriguez, who, you know, later on, I go on to know them as friends. But um, reading their words in those magazines about the artists that, you know, I was, you know, starstruck by, that was that played a very big role in my understanding of the music business. So when I had the opportunity to meet Joaquin Wadeen, one of the co-founders of Rough Riders, of all places at, at a cheesecake factory, I can't say I knew the right thing to say, but I think my passion and my sense of understanding was evident to him. So uh, short story, I ended up interning on Jada Kiss's sophomore album, Kiss of Death. And uh, that had me working out of Worldwide Plaza. And if you know music, you know that's the headquarters for Island Def Jam and um, the, the, the labels that they distribute for or with. And I spent my senior year of high school interning on Kiss of Death. And I spent the summer before college going to Morehouse interning on Cameron's Purple Haze. 
So I didn't have a favorite in the versus battle between the locks and the dip set until Jada Kiss said Cam lives in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like early on you kind of were more geared towards music because of, you know, the exposures from your uncles to recording artists or recording studio. But you got to Morehouse, you didn't study music. Like, what did you study at Morehouse? At Morehouse, I went in to study political science, and Keith Hollingsworth told me, that's not for you. <laughs> and then I heard about Tobes Johnson, and then, and then I realized maybe not. And I thought it was going to be business marketing, but I, me and business policy weren't going to get along. <laughs> but then after interning at Bloomberg in my sophomore year, I, I came to realize that my real skill set and my strong suit was really more in comms. And I realized that the sharp edge of the saber for me would be English degree, right? And focusing on comms as my way into marketing. But the road in through music. And the other thing that I really loved about my time uh, as an A&R intern for Alima Shamsuddin, who ironically enough would later go on to work at Translation with Steve Stout. What I loved about the work I was doing or the work I was learning and coming to understand was where all the dots connected, right? Fast forward later strategy, right? But also my eye, my ear for product placement. It was always mentioned in bars and raps, but then you also go on to see it in music videos. And I was wondering, you know, how'd that get there? Being a Jamaican kid from the Bronx, my, when my dad and my mom dropped me off with spend time with my granddad, I would always get end up in the box with all the James Bond movies. 007. And it was always just like the best product placement, whether it was the Aston Martin or it was the Omega or it was the Brightling or it was the BMW or it was even Avis, you know, talking about cars. Like my, I was always groomed or cured to see where things connect and where brands fit. Interesting. And, uh, going into college in Atlanta at that time, right, 2004. Voter Die was the brand on campus, right? And Morehouse is the brand and Spellman is the brand. And, you know, not just because they're the brand in the A, but nostalgically they're the brand because you see them in Boys in the Hood, right? You see them on the Fresh Prince, right? You see them referenced on a different world. You know, you might see it pop up in Living Single. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I distinctly remember in my senior year, not deciding what school to go to. And I graduated high school with honors, so I had options, but I, I chose Morehouse for... I think influenced by two big scenes. I'll never forget there was a couple scenes or episodes of Making the Band where Puffy, who's ironically from my hometown, my, I moved from the Bronx, I moved to Mount Vernon, and Mount Vernon's the hometown of a couple of legacy individuals, uh, most notably DMX, rest in peace, but also uh, Sean Combs and Denzel Washington, whose son, uh, John David, uh, went to Morehouse, and Denzel has his doctorate from Morehouse. But seeing... Puff in that Morehouse Letterman just always like put something in my head. And I know he went to Howard, no, he didn't finish Howard, but seeing him wear that just all, like put something in my head. And then there was this one scene in the real world San Francisco, ironically, as I, I'm, I live here in, 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 on the West Coast in the Bay primarily. There was this one scene with Jacques where he had, you know, he was confronted with an in, instance of racism. And the way he handled it, and then me finding out who went to Morehouse and, and seeing him in the Morehouse shirt, that just left a real big impression on me also. So for those reasons, and as well as the school's legacy and Benny Mays and Dr. King and Spike and, you know, Bob and all these amazing people, those are really big reasons why I think I chose Morehouse and going to Morehouse and doing the internships I did at Bloomberg from sophomore year to senior year, I came to just realize that comms was really my gift, strategy, and connecting the dots authentically and organically for brands is another gift that I have. And I'm not going to probably have the best shot doing and delivering against that if I go the traditional road of like getting a business management degree or a political science degree. Yeah, because those degrees are pretty, I mean, pretty common at Morehouse. Like I just remember even from the years that I was there, right outside of Wheeler Hall, everyone's out there in their suits, political science folks, the business folks. I mean, I was a math major, like, <laughs> we just walk right past them, you know. So I, I know what you mean, though. I mean, Morehouse itself, outside of all the names and stuff that you mentioned, just sort of has this this draw for a lot of people. But it's so interesting because, it, I, I mean, in a way, it sort of depends what you end up going into kind of either during school or after school. Because, like, I 
started going into design right after school and even working at places in Atlanta where I was not the only black person. I was surprised how many people had never heard of Morehouse, didn't Mm. know what it was, didn't know where it was. I'm like, it's here in Atlanta. Like, I remember my first day at AT AT&T when uh, I had told some people on my team I was at Morehouse and they were like, oh, where's that? And I was like, well, if you look out the window, you see that green roof way off in the distance? That's Morehouse. And they're like, oh, I didn't know Atlanta went down that far. I'm like, give me a break. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) So, I mean, you had these opportunities for doing these internships. What was your kind of early career like after you graduated? It sounds like what I'm hearing is that you probably had something lined up once you graduated from Morehouse. Yeah. You know, I could have stayed at Bloomberg and did the A desk, you know, analytics desk thing. But going from a and R to comms and then looking at analytics just didn't feel like the best fit. And I, you know, to my parents, it looked foolish at the time, but I had a vision for the bigger idea. I ended up honestly working for free in Tribeca for Damon Dash right up and Cootie and Chike, Chike Oza and uh, Clarence Cootie Simmons at Creative Control TV and, and DD172. And I say for free because it was in turn, it was an apprenticeship in every sense, in the sense that, you know, you really had to get in there for yourself, but also the things, you know, you were learning from real masters of their craft. Kanye on Drink Champs was just talking, you know, about the degree of reverence and respect he has for Damon, you know, despite whatever issues or bad blood, Jay-Z would have been remiss if he did not acknowledge Damon in his, you know, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction speech. Yeah. <laughs> so having the opportunity to be a strategy apprentice to Cootie and Chike and work on product placement for brands like uh, Pepsi, Adidas, Heineken, Porsche was really, really a great opportunity for me. And it brought, you know, future forward that early eye and appetite I had for connecting dots authentically and organically with brands from when I was a kid watching these 007 movies. And then, you know, from working on Purple Haze my summer before college, and then getting a chance to kind of learn from the master, so to speak, after college was really great to me. In my time at Bloomberg, I worked across ad sales for print, one of their print titles called Markets Magazine. I worked across uh, key accounts at the time when the subprime mortgage crisis hit. I was actually staffed on Bear Stearns. (laughs) So talk about learning trial by fire. And then in my last summer, I worked on event planning for uh, key territories, North America. And that Bloomberg is stacked in a way of its radio, TV, and and print and, and terminal. And similarly, as I learned in my time working in Tribeca there, they had the gallery, they had the mezzanine for creative control TV, but they also had executive suites and offices and filming space. And they had an event, uh, an event performance space you know, downstairs, as well as the recording studio that was manned by Ski Beats, the producer who did the, the bulk of Jay-Z's Reasonable Doubt. And I looked at them as like two sides of a coin, almost like parallel learning opportunities, right? One was a big global enterprise by a billionaire, even though he was the mayor at the time, right? And the other was a factory led by the idea engine that birthed two billionaires, speaking about Jay-Z and Kanye West. So granted, they weren't billionaires at the time, but it was evident with the way that I, what I, from what I learned of Damon's process, it was a great complement to what I had learned at Morehouse. Ironically, working on Heineken at DD172 and Creative Control led to me working on Heineken at Team Epiphany, an agency owned by a Morehouse alum named Coltrane Curtis. So during that time when you're kind of working as a strategy apprentice, and as you say, you were doing it like for free, like how were you feeling during that time? Like what was going through your mind during that time? At the time, I initially loved peanut butter and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And by the time <laughs> I was done with that, I hated the idea of paste anything. <laughs> Justin's peanut butter or otherwise, just I was over it. But at that time, DIY, do it yourself was a new phrase, a new concept, right? Social was still very fresh. And um, when I wasn't in Tribeca, I was spending the rest of my time in the Lower East Side at the A-Life Rivington Club Courtyard or at Reed Space, you know, founded by Jeff Staple, or at Prohibit, which was 
helmed by uh, Chase Infinite, who later went on to become the manager for ASAP Mob and Griselda. At the time, I was just always in the mode to learn. I knew there were things I learned on campus and in school. You know, uh, one thing I didn't mention in my time in Atlanta is for a while I was an apprentice to Clay Evans, who is the road manager for a lot of successful Southern hip hop artists, but notably T.I. and Travis Scott. One of the things I really appreciate what I learned running with Clay was there's a lot of things that you don't learn in the classroom, right? There's a lot of on the job ex- learning and understanding and expertise that you have to observe in the moment, right? To get good at the job. Um, it's mm-hmm. like being a page at NBC or something. So I spent a lot of my time, you know, when I wasn't on campus, I was up in Castleberry Hill at Slice, right? Or over at City of Ink with, you know, Tuki and Maya, Tuki Carter and Maya Bailey. And at the time, like I said, I was just always in the mode to learn. And what I was thinking and feeling at that time is there's a lot of opportunity for influencers, right? And later on, obviously, that became really true. But at the time, it was just seeing things in motion. You know, your online presence didn't matter. You, you really, people really had to know you, right? Like outside, like you weren't getting inside. You weren't going to make it, you know, unless you were on the list or you knew the right thing to say or you came with the right people. I saw a change coming, but I also just really appreciated like the time and the moment when people really had to know each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know those kind of times where, especially once you're, once you're first starting to get out there and you're not going right into a particular job, there's so much networking that you have to do. Like, so let's see if you, you say you you went to Morales in 04. So this was like around like 08, 09, where you were doing a lot of this. Correct. Yeah. I remember being in the city during that time was like a super, really sort of buzzy time, particularly if you were doing things around like design or tech or something like that. It was just a lot of energy and activity going on in the city. You could go down to like Octane and end up meeting up with folks or you'd go to some, you know, meetup or some other event or something like that. Of course, now with the pandemic, a lot of that. <laughs> that was a phrase like meetup, like the, like the meetup, the, you know. The, yeah. Uh, um, Eventbrite. Eventbrite was it. Yeah. QR codes, early QR codes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of that during that time. And I mean, of course, now with the pandemic, it's it's not the same, but you certainly had there was. Oh, God, I remember that so vividly because that was right around the time I was at at and and I was I quit my job and then started my studio. And so I just had free days all the time because I, I had some clients. But, you know, you go, you talk to other creatives, you see what other work you can get into, see what other projects you can fall into, something like that. Like Atlanta sort of facilitated that type of creative spark in a way to go out oh. to these places and meet people and do things like it was so, I mean, in hindsight, it was so easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, it looked easy, you know, Dave Chappelle talks about um, expensive experience, right? And it's, I do it in five minutes because you're paying me for the five, seven years it took me to learn how to do it in five minutes. Right. You're not paying me for the time I did it. You're paying me for the time I prepped to get it done at the level as projected and as expected. Right. Um, But to the tune of Atlanta and like training, right, like Jedi level training, how to homecoming in itself, but then also Market Friday, you know, Wednesday on on the yard, the city, Rocky Road over there by Piedmont Park. Um, mm-hmm. little five points, you know, I was just talking to a client the other day and working on some brand identity work. And she was referencing, you know, her time her, in the early shaping of wish, right. And how it's now like basically a cultural institution. In oh area. yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, the whole thing about it is even a little five points you have, to, you know, move carefully, you know, you don't know what kid in Sperry's or what guy with face tattoos. you don't know who's who, right. So <laughs> Act accordingly. And this is Atlanta in 04, 09, 2011, 2013. I'm yeah. talking about Atlanta today. So um, <laughs> it's a totally different. I mean, you've been to Atlanta recently. Like, it's a totally different vibe over there now because largely because of gentrification. Gentrification and decriminalization, I think. And du- the dual pandemics um, yeah. have certainly played a, a role in how leadership and community have to respond and adjust for sure. Mm, yeah, that's true. It's, a, it's also a gold rush at the same time right now. You know, you're like, if you're up, you're up. <laughs> mm, that's true. Yeah. So you've worked at, you know, quite a few agencies. You mentioned Team Epiphany. 
You've also been at IPG. You've been at Momentum. Like when you look back at those agency experiences, what do you think like was the most impactful based on where and what you do now? I guess just going off of um, networking and best, um, I guess uh, Jason Bourne, um, muscle memory, tradecraft, right? Like where that's learned, how that's shaped steel on steel and right, how it's alchemized and uh, where that's um, applied or deployed. You mentioned Momentum. So I've done like three tours with IPG. Uh, Momentum, media brands. I consulted for a while at, at, with Octagon on Adidas. Ironically, I just got a text from a Morehouse bro who uh, is now at Adidas covering Atlanta, at NY, and ATL. I wanted to talk about some ideas. So look at God, right? I guess I'll talk about Momentum first since I already spoke about Martin. Well, no, I, I can talk about Momentum second. Though. Media brands, I think that the biggest memory or experience I had with, with media brands was hosting the Super Bowl USA Today ad meter watch party in New Orleans. That was heavy just because I was, it was post team epiphany, post doing some postgrad studies at Rutgers Center for Management Development, the CMD. And being in a room with like the CMO of Subway, you know, uh, Susan Creedle, you know, to name a few people, serious stakes. And I really credit the five Wells from Morehouse and so on and so forth with kind of giving me that training and that base practice to know like how to move in that room. Talking about moving in rooms, talking about like global, my favorite memory, I guess, or learned experience from Momentum is um, shortly after I'd left Momentum, I took my first leadership director role as um, strategy chief at First Staff Machine, which is actually a production company, not even an ad agency. But part of my deal with First Staff is I went with two of the partners to Khan for the Creative Lions. And I bumped into the CEO of Momentum, Chris Weil, on La Crozette. <laughs> and watching his head spin, after I said, hi, Chris, you know, because he's used to see me in New Orleans, mm-hmm. what's the doing here? And I gave him an answer, but walking down the rest of La Crozette on the way back to Palais de Festival, I was thinking like, yeah, what am I doing here, right? You know, you're hanging with Bon and Bo, having Rosé on, on, on a pier, right? And you're, you know, all of what, 25, 27, right? So <laughs> it's dope to even be able to have memories like that. So when I stay in touch with people like Bonin today, right, whether it's about anything, I have that memory and that connection or that, I don't know what you call it, what, uh, what do they call it? A sign of early promise or whatever as a reference. So that's momentum, that's media brands. Martin, I'd say, yeah, just being there with them through agent for agency of the year, you know, at the part where it's really gridlock in the mud, like any given Sunday, rainy day stuff, like answering briefs, you know, when the world's upside down, isn't an easy job. So I'll just leave it there on that. And learning from their leadership, uh, Elizabeth Paul and the leaders who I report to was just a really great experience to switch. And I think I spoke a bit about the classroom, like Google and then go outside, knowing that they remembered that through three classes and that some success stories. I have a couple of students who some of my, uh, my Padawans who learned some of my Jedi ways, I guess, <laughs> but they've gone on to do well for themselves. And one of them is a uh, associate project manager at Fluent360, AAPR Nissan. Another, uh, another student is a account executive for Whirlpool for uh, corporate orders. Two of them decided to start their own shop, hopefully gets absorbed by a bigger shop one day because I know they have the chops to do it. I guess before that, in my curatorial space, like working as a curator and commissioning private commissions and and sales, I would say biggest memory from that, I'd say like the opening day of my first show was a, you know, I'm literally doing everything, right? I'm getting food delivered, buying a case of wine and, you know, getting champagne. And that same day, a review came out written by Antoine Sergeant who's now the director of Gagosian Worldwide. And at the time he wrote the review, he was uh, he wrote it for Vice. And that came out in the afternoon. And before the show closed, I sold my first piece. And it was like a four-figure photo essay. So that was hard to top. But then I topped it by doing a three-month resident. That no window shopping residency ran for five months in Williamsburg. And that was followed by a three-month residency in the mission in San Francisco later that year. And the only reason why I didn't do Brexit the only reason why I didn't do no window shopping UK was because of Brexit had just hit at the time. But yeah, those I think are my, my big uh, memories and takeaways outside of my time in music. And I guess knowing that I worked on Jada Kiss's sophomore album, 
that hit Billboard when it debuted, and I worked on Currency's Pilot Talk, and I was at DD172, and that did Billboard when it de- that did a big debut when it hit Billboard. Those are my memories from those times, and I guess all the rest of them are a blur. You know, lots of late nights. <laughs> So you've been achieving all this success. Like after you graduated, you really kind of like made your own way, starting out doing this kind of free apprenticeship thing and then working with agencies. You produced this no window shopping event. And then during this time, you ended up going to grad school. Like what spurred that decision? Yeah, I graduated magna cum laude from NYU Tisch with my master's in art and public policy. And Connecting all of the dots from going to Morehouse and, oh, I'd be remiss if I didn't credit this. A big impression on me from my time at Bloomberg was Bloomberg Philanthropies. And I think it kind of groomed my eye to the power and duty of big global interests and those types of firms when it comes to corporate social responsibility, which I guess we now call social impact, right, for all intents and purposes. And... With my work with like social clubs like Noya House or Soho House or even co-working spaces like The Yard, owned by Morris Levy, I was always very intent on being accountable for the diversity in the room and the diversity I brought to the room. And in time, you know, being around like the four A's and Ad Color and those types of organizations and initiatives, I've just come to see like inclusion, diversity, and equity, and social impact really more married than they're recognized for. And a big part of what drew my attention to the art and public policy program is I saw it as a way to bring forward my my passion for the arts, you know, through music and my experience and my, uh, I guess you could say, success as a curator, right? And the way I see the relationship of art community And artists, whether you call them influencers or otherwise, um, how that relates to brand. You know, when you look at it, right, even if you go to like the Whitney or the Underground Museum or, you know, the Studio Museum in Harlem or the High Museum in Atlanta or SFMOM or, you know, whichever institution you want to patron, you're going to see it sponsored by these big brands, right? So I was really interested in that initially. But the real reason why I ended up going to do the program is I found as I was getting more press and like Vice or SF Bold Italic or Hyperallergic or so forth, some of the questions I was being approached with by the writers and maybe sometimes even the questions I was being approached with by uh, collectors or or representatives of institutions that I'd meet uh, who came to my openings or came to the events that I put together as part of the culture programming uh, to stem my shows or my exhibitions and my group exhibitions from opening to closing. I will be honest. I don't like the phrase. I don't know. Coming out of Morehouse, you know, it's uh, not a phrase you hear very frequently on the yard. And if you do hear it, it's met with like raised eyebrows. Like, what do you mean you don't know? Like either you're not invested or you're not trying. But being approached with questions that I didn't have um, ready aim fire answers for wasn't something I was used to happy about or comfortable with. You know, when you don't know, that means you need more knowledge. It just worked out that my academic advisor was the artist Karen Elizabeth Finley in my time at Tisch, and I had the privilege and opportunity to do electives at NYU Stern, NYU Steinhardt. And in that time, I was a teaching assistant to Rosalie Goldberg, the founder of the Performa Biennial and director emeritus of The Kitchen, which is like a legacy institution in Chelsea for or anyone who knows about the arts from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Now, you mentioned earlier about, excuse me, about being a lecturer at the University of Illinois at Chicago. How did that opportunity come about? Yeah, that is serendipity. And luck is really just preparation, patience, and timing, right? And you could just, just boil it down to that, because at the time, I just finished my master's, and I had envisioned or fancied myself going to a firm like Laplace Cohen, right? Because that would be like a beautiful marriage of the things that I had done and the interest I'd cultivated and and cured to that point, you know, with my master's program. In the time I was at Tisch doing my master's, I did my graduate field work with Twitter and creative time. It didn't take. And then 45 
crush the endowments for the arts and the humanities with one pen stroke. So the funding for, for the things I wanted to do, but the pool got a lot smaller. It was going to be like limited like fellowships and things like that. And my wife, Nicole, decided that she wanted to pursue her master's degree. So she got into the 2Y program at Northwestern Kellogg and spent a lot of time in Chicago looking to maybe explore and expand my curatorial practice in that city. It was slow motion on that. And it just happened one day I was at a restaurant and some the individual, the lovely lady that sat next to me, this was all pre-pandemic, right? Um, no face mask required. We struck up a conversation and she was sharing about her daughter and her daughter going to Notre Dame and looking to do business and looking for internship opportunities. And I empathetically, generously offered to say, well, if she has any interest in Bloomberg, she's trying to start her way in through media. I'd be more than happy to make an introduction. I actually know one or two more house alums who are still there. It wouldn't be a problem. And she gave me her card and we got in touch and I was looking for opportunities maybe with the school. And uh, when she looked at my LinkedIn, and she hit me back. She was just like, we should talk. I was like, yeah, I looked at some opportunities on the site I'd like to talk about. She's like, no, you should teach. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And yeah, I, I joined the faculty as an adjunct lecturer. Within a semester, I was promoted to visiting a uh, lecturer of culture and innovation in the managerial studies program, the College of Business Administration at UIC. When you look back at that time, what did your students teach you? Oh, Wow. A lot of my students were first-gen uh, college attendees. A fair number of them were new immigrants, ESL. They taught me a lot about patience and empathy. But they also taught me, I would say, but my pedagogy at UIC was really cured around critical thinking, immersive play, team dynamics, and group work. And what they taught me is that this generation needs a lot more help training, coaching, and practice in group work. It's a lot of I, I focus, you know, iPhone, I watch, Instagram. And a lot of the appetite for instant gratification, I think, makes it hard to develop the patience and empathy to be a good team player. So that's why in, in, in my two-year tenure at UIC, I passed on midterms and finals, and I ran my classes like agencies, 14-week sprints. And ironically, that was really good practice and training for me doing sprints for master class and then Martin. But in the way I ran the classes and or the, the, the agency is as class, it was to do with, you know, your four teams are broke up in fours, right? Account, uh, media, creative and art direction and giving them those, uh, I guess, buckets to play in. Seeing how they use that to uh, acquiesce to the using immersive play to acquiesce to better group work, right, by making it immersive was very insightful for me. And I was not shy about using and applying that to the juniors I managed as a planning director at Martin. Now, let's say someone out here is listening to this and they're picking up all the names you mentioned and all the different opportunities and things that you've done. If somebody out there wants to sort of follow in your footsteps, what advice would you give them? Besides Google and go outside, I would say know your power. Leonard McCurvey, goes by Charlemagne the God, he has um, that show now on Comedy Central. Um, he has a book out about knowing how to apply and leverage. The word he uses is privilege, but I feel like that's a bit cagey. You know, we want to be careful with the teeth on this. But knowing how to learn and leverage your superpowers is really important. I wear glasses, right? I'm a New York kid. I talk fast. There are times I'm in the room where overdressed. There are times I'm in the room coming from another series of a couple of events or meetings where I'm client facing to that audience and I might find myself underdressed, which isn't really true because I'm always confident about it. So I, I wear a Yankee cap into City Hall, which I've actually done before. So there's that. But I'll use that my Yankee cap as like a springboard, right? Because it's me being true to myself. Like I'm from the Bronx. I'm proud to say it. You know, I'm from the same place as Ralph Lipschitz and Calvin Klein, Judge Sotomayor, right? So I've always been keen to like know and not be shy about what my superpowers are. And at the same time, I would caution and advise, you know, be mindful of other people's superpowers and their sensitivities, right? But make one of your superpowers curbing sensitivities and amping room for empathy and collaboration, 
one of the big takeaways I also remember from my time at Momentum was the idea of the, not really, the philosophy and the practice of co-creation. Like answer the brief with the client. Don't just answer the brief for the client. And likewise in relationships, whether they're emerging or continuing, be the friend that's like the therapist, not the friend that's the friend that people need to see a therapist about. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think your life would have gone if you weren't doing what you do now? That's a really good question. When I was a little boy, I thought I wanted to be a judge. And as I got older, you know, like volume two on cassette, I saw myself working in management because I really have a passion for the artists. I'm just, you know, evident to any artist where I'm not, who I ever paid a studio visit to, right? Who I ever featured in a show or even if they weren't in, sh in the show, uh, I curated, uh, I featured them in some culture programming I was doing for a social club or a client. It, yes, it's not so much more about like the power trip with like judges and lawyers, but about having the power to defend and to to represent, right? For people who might not be best equipped to represent themselves or their value, right? And but I think working as a creative, right, whether that's a creative strategist or a curator or a creative producer, you know, in a lot of ways, you, you have almost more responsibility and power than a judge. Because while a judge can set precedent um, as a creative, you can inform or almost even at some times dictate culture, right? And ultimately, culture is the law of the land and it rules the day it almost rides higher than the law in a lot of cases, which is one of the things that leads to us redrafting and reshaping culture. So what I just said is basically what, you know, a lot of what I learned in my master's program in art and public policy, because there's culture, lowercase c, and there's culture, capital C, right? Mm -hmm. And then their culture is lowercase c, but culture informs policy and policy inform, culture informs public policy and public policy ultimately informs legislative and written policy. What do you want your legacy to be? Like when you look back at your career, you look back at what you've accomplished to where you are now, like what do you want to do like in the next few years or so, something like that? In the next few years, my big bet is automated retail. And I have a smart answer for that. More coming soon. <laughs> but I guess if when it's all said and done, a lot of people will laugh and libate um, to my memory and say, he sometimes had a long voiceover, right? And sometimes it was a lot to follow, but it all came with a lot of passion. And if you know, you're listening, you understand. And even if you don't understand, he, he, he always cared enough to break it down. He was the type of guy who would sit with you for an hour helping you with a problem when you asked when you asked, when you asked him for five dollars. He was like, you don't need my five dollars. I just gave you like five million dollars worth of insight and energy. And it would wouldn't be bad, uh, I guess, if people say he loved hard and he played hard. Because I think for me ultimately that's what it comes down to. Frustration is just fun with a lot of filler letters in the middle. And I've always part of why I guess I chose English, right? And leadership studies at Morehouse instead of business marketing or political science is because in those more constrictive spaces, it's hard to start the tape with, let's cut down frustration. Let's just get to the fun, right? What does that mean? What does, you know, how does that work? What are you talking about? It's like, I'm talking about the answer to the brief. I'm talking about the way to start today's lecture. You know, I'm talking about a way to get over worrying about the glass breaking on the shadow box and the show starts in a few minutes. Let's go Banksy with it, right? Let's put it through a paper shredder. Let's see what happens. Well, just to, you know, wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work and everything online? Dre Powers, D-R-E-P-O-W-E-R-S. Dre Powers. Everything is basically Dre Powers. You can find me on that and um, you can see some of my legacy work and some of my latest work on appendixworks.com. A-P-P-E-N-D-I-X-W-O-R-K-S dot com. Sounds good. Well, Andre Smith, I want to thank you 
first so much for coming on the show. One, you know, just for sharing your expansive career and the work that you've done. But I think also it's it's good, you know, certainly for people in our audience to hear, like you mentioned, you know, sort of the passion behind the work that you do. Like clearly you have a love for this. You have a knack for it. You have an affinity for it. And um, I'm glad that you were able to really share that with our audience through this interview today. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you for the space and the time. Big, big thanks to Andre Smith. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Andre and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. And of course, thanks to our wonderful sponsor, Brevity and Wit. Brevity and Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit, creative excellence without the grind. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. So what did you think of the interview? Better yet, what do you think about the podcast overall? If you've made it now to the end of the show and you're listening to this, don't be a stranger. Hit us up on Twitter. Hit us up on Instagram. You can just search for Revision Path, all one word. Or leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Every little review is like a little present that lets me know that you're listening to the show, you're loving the show. I'm not just saying that because it's the holidays, but it fits the whole present metaphor. Anyway, let everyone you know know about the show because it really helps us grow and reach more people all around the world. Happy holidays to all that are out there listening. And as always, thank you so much and we'll see you next time.